Good morning. And welcome to First Baptist Church of Catania. We're glad you chose to worship with us here this morning. Uh, first off, uh, I've got a couple announcements to make. And the, uh, the Bible study will be at uh, 6.30 this, uh, on Wednesday. Also, the choir rehearsal, we're getting back to the choir rehearsal on Wednesdays also, and that will be at 7.30. Uh, Saturday, the men's breakfast, so try to attend that. Uh, we that's a look forward to that. And also, the uh, church picnic, uh, try to keep that in mind, and uh, it'll be coming up on the uh, uh, September the 11th. And also the homecoming dinner of the September the 25th. So if you haven't filled this, the, the, uh, the film out yet, go ahead and fill that out if you would, please. And also this morning, I don't know if you noticed or not, but in, our, in your bulletin, we've got the responsive reading. We're going to do the responsive reading this morning after the first, first hymn. So uh, keep that in mind. You, the, uh, you will follow along with that. So uh, thank you, Jennifer. Good morning. Uh, the youth group is going to be starting up again in September. We're still doing the second and fourth Tuesday of every month, so it'll be September 13th. I'm really, really excited to, to get going back with the kids again. Um, I am coming to you today to ask for prayer. Just please pray for our youth and please pray for the teenagers in our group. It, it's hard to be a kid. I know we're older and we kind of forget, but it, it's hard going through that time of life, and um, just please, please pray for them, and I will humbly ask you, please pray for me as their leader. Sometimes, thank you God, we have 15, 16, 17 kids, which is an amazing blessing, and I love it, and thank God they're good kids, because I think, oh my goodness, it's <laughs> a lot of kids for one person, so just please continue to play, pray for our group, and that um, God is there, God is leading us, and we are just giving them everything that we can give them in that short amount of time to get them through the challenges that they have in their life, so keep praying, I'd appreciate it, thank you. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. This morning for a call to worship, I'm going to read from Psalms chapter 3. Lord, I have, no, I have so many enemies, so many are against me, so many are saying, God will never rescue him. But you are, Lord, on my shield around me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord, and, you, and he answered me in the holy mountain. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I am not afraid for 10,000 enemies who surround me every day on every side. Arise, O Lord, rescue me of my God. Slap all, slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of my, the wicked, and victory comes to you, from you, O Lord, and you bless my, my people. Uh, let's pray. Just as David was thinking everyone was against him, he knew that the, tw the trust of God in, in your darkest hour, that we can overcome fear by trusting God for his protection. Prayer is a powerful tool, but we must use it. We come to you the prayer today asking for your strength in overcoming our fears and weaknesses. Be with Pastor Brady this morning. He brings forth his message of hope and through prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And all the people said, good morning. You know, this three Sundays after this and it's it, that's it for me. And so it's one of those things where you start to think, well, this is the last time that's going to happen here at First Baptist. And, and today when I see the communion table before, I say, this will be the last, last supper I help celebrate here at, at First Baptist, unless I visit in the future. And so, you know, I just want to... 
I, I want to reminisce a little bit in these last few weeks, and I'll talk to that about with the kids here in a little bit. But you know, we have a very busy um, worship service this morning with, with communion, and we're going to talk about prayer today. And I'll tell you what, over this past week, maybe two weeks, maybe, maybe three weeks, the, the focus of the Lord and the Holy Spirit working in the life of myself and, and our church has been a focus on prayer. And, and when someone asks, uh, is it okay if I ask for prayer for me? Absolutely. Do not be afraid to ask for prayer for yourself. Because the more people praying for you, uh, the better things are going to be for you. And, and, you know, I was reading something. I wrote this message that you're going to hear on Tuesday. Uh, on Thursday, I heard, I heard this. And it wasn't a quote. It was because whoever, whoever wrote it didn't know who said it to them. They, they said, they said if, if the Word of God is our daily bread, and I believe it is, then, then prayer is our oxygen. And I, I just love that. So as you think about and we meditate and hear about prayer today, just kind of breathe that in and breathe that out. Prayer is our oxygen. Can you say amen to that? Let, let's continue to wash it. Would you please stand as we sing number 230, The Old Rugged Cross.
You may be seated. If you uh, see the uh, insert in your bulletin about the response of reading, uh, one time Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Forgive us our sins, for we forgive everyone who has done wrong, and do, do not bring us into hard testing. And Jesus said to his disciples, Suppose one of you should go to a friend's house at midnight and tell him, Friend, let me borrow three loaves of bread. A friend of mine who is on a trip has just come to my house, and I don't have a thing to offer him. And suppose your friend should answer by, from inside. Don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children are in bed, and I can't give, uh, get up to give you anything. Well, then what? I can tell you, even if you will not get up and give you the bread, as it is your friend, then you will get up and give you everything you need, because you are not ashamed to keep on asking. And I say to, your, to you, Ask not what you receive, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks will receive, and he who seeks will find, and the door will be open to him who knocks. As bad as you are, you know that you give a good thanks to your children. How much more then will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? say all the people said. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, with hearts filled with gratitude, we praise you for this Lord's Day. The table is set and we have come anxious to participate in a Holy Spirit anointed worship service that glorifies the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. As we bring to remembrance the words and the deeds of our Savior, spoken and done on the night in which he was betrayed, Father, we are taken back like your followers with you that night, Lord Jesus, as we realize our need to, to consider our capability of dishonoring you with our words and with our deeds. Divine Counselor, Holy Spirit, we lay our hearts open asking you to bring to light any unconfessed sin that would make us unworthy to receive the blessing of this ordinance we're about to receive during this service. Father, forgive us our sin and be merciful towards us. Teach us your ways so that we may walk in your path so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Hope encouragement and endurance given so we will have the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ has towards us. Father, give us a spirit of unity in our pursuit of Christ Jesus so that with one heart and with one mouth we may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, be to, to be perfectly united in my thought, boy, it might sound like an impossibility even among we, your people. But Lord, as you called a church in Corinth to do so, we ask that it will be true of us as well. Gracious God, in, in a time of transmission, uh, transition, ma many things can, can take place. And, and Lord, as we await the pastor who, who will bring, bring shepherding to us, dear Lord, stir up those among us who are scripturally qualified and mature to be the elders of our First Baptist Church of Catanning, and move them, Father God, to be diligent in their responsibilities. Lord, in an age when there is so much need to be concerned for the physical safety of our members, surely, Father, we must be on guard against those thieves and those robbers who might creep in among the fold and turn out to be those wolves looking for someone to devour. 
Lord God, as you have gifted each and every holy child of yours who worships and serves here with their unique abilities, I pray that the time has come for these gifted individuals to unite their hearts, to humble themselves, and to be a church. Father, in your son's name, we pray for the sick of our church. We pray for the lonely of our church. We pray for the poor of our church. We pray that you continue to answer our daily prayers for one another as we pray for one another unceasingly. And Father, we also ask that you find us, your people, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in this community. Lord God, with so many people in need of so much, provide for us the means and the ways to provide daily bread for both the body and the spirit. Father God, I want to thank you for this facility. And I want to thank you more for the people who worship and serve here in and from this facility. And, and please use us all in this all for your glory and for your glory alone, I pray in Jesus' holy and his precious name. Amen.
Come on up, kids. after this week, and so a lot of things that, that I'm doing will be the last time I do them here at First Baptist, and you know what? This might be the last children's uh, message I have the blessing of, of giving you kids, and you know, all these things are making me think about the things that have happened over the past six and a half years since I've come to First Baptist, and you know, some of my greatest blessings have been watching you guys grow up. Do you know that? In fact, oftentimes, oftentimes, to help us remember things, we go back, do you ever go back and look at old photographs, pictures, like on your cell phones and things like that? I, look, I go back and look at my family's photos, clear back to around 1900. Do you know how long ago that was? That was like, oh, let me say, about 122 years ago. I have pictures of my grandmother and things like that from back then. It's kind of awesome to go back and look. In a couple seconds, I want to show you a picture, but all this reminds me of a passage of scripture that, uh, that we read in the book of Philippians chapter one. And, and this is a prayer that the, the apostle Paul wrote and, and said, uh, and it came from his heart and it comes from mine. And I want to say this to you, okay? So listen to what I have here for you. It says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he, will be, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I thank my God for you. And one of the great blessings of that passage of scripture is it tells us that God has begun to work in you. Did you know God is working in you? He is. He's with you and he's working with you. And you know what? When I look at photographs of you, and here's where I want to show you something. I want to come over here and I want to show you a couple of photographs, okay? And see if you recognize anybody in these photographs. Let me start over here. I know that's not, that's not, do you recognize any of these guys? No. Yeah. yeah, who do you recognize? I recognize you three guys. Uh, and let's see, Luke, are you in here? I don't see Luke. Where were you that day, Luke? You're usually up here. I miss you that day. And let me see. Uh, oh, do, do you recognize that girl? Yeah, that's you. You know, you know when this was? This was around Easter time three and a half years ago. Three and a half years ago. And, and I know it's not, oh, you see that? That's you, isn't it? Do you see how short you are? <laughs> You're getting so tall. And then here's another one. This is, a, this is my favorite photograph that I ever took here at First Baptist. That's me with short hair, short hair almost bald. Do you recognize anybody in that picture? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You're there, aren't you? You're there. How about that? That was awesome. I wish, I wish they guys could see it. It's the one where I was, I was here, I was here, and I went like this and took a selfie. You remember that? Now, you know what I want to do today? I'm going to ask my wife to take a picture of us similar to that, only I'm not going to take a selfie, okay? Jan, would you take a picture of me and these kids so that years from now, Years from now, I want to look at this picture, and I'll still be thanking God from you. And you know what? I know you'll probably forget, but when you go through things like school, when you go through high school graduation, when you get married, when you have children, I want you to try to remember that one preacher we had said I was going to be praying, he was going to be praying for us. And I'm going to keep praying for you guys, okay? Because God has started something good in you. And he's going to carry it on. So let him do that, okay? Can I get in this picture? Everybody crowd in here. Oh, 
Is he putting rabbit ears behind me? <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you. I can't wait. You know, for years, years from now, I'll look at that and say, I wonder what these guys are up to. And one of these days, you'll be thinking, oh, that guy, that preacher, he's probably so old, he's in heaven already. So let's pray, okay? <laughs> and I am going to be in heaven someday. Are you? Oh, yes, we can pray for Bella's knee. Did you, did you do that riding a bike, or what did you do? A skateboard. That was my second guess. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for these children, dear Lord. Oh, my, how they have grown. Uh, Lord, I, I, I think of what's taken place over these few years here, and some of these children weren't, weren't even born. And, Father, as we get to pray for Bella today and pray for her knee, I want her to know, as well as the rest of these kids, dear Lord, myself and the rest of this church is praying for them. And Lord, let's commit, let us commit to praying for them each and every day. And as Susan, Susan Ann has asked for prayer, dear Lord, I want to lift her up this morning because you have given her charge of our children. And Lord, she's doing a fantastic job. Lord, give her the energy. Give her the strength. Lord, because you've sure given her the joy. So we pray for her and for our youth group, dear Lord, in every aspect of what takes place with our children in this church, including Children's Church on Sunday, dear Lord. So again, bless Bella with healing, Father God, and meet the needs. Answer the prayers of all these kids here. I pray in Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see those pictures. All right. Let's take a Bible and open it up to Matthew's Gospel. Yeah, Matthew's Gospel. <laughs> Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read verses 36 through 46. And then we're going to get over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. And we'll be reading verses 8 through 19. So you may want to mark that place. The message title this morning is, Does Praying Make a Difference? And I want you to notice something. It, it, the question is not, does prayer make a difference? It's, does praying make a difference? I mean, pra prayer is prayer, and praise God for prayer. Prayer is a noun. Prayer, prayer is a thing. It's kind of like, th there's the pastoral prayer, right? It's a noun. There, there's the Lord's prayer. There's the opening prayer, the closing prayer. There's the prayer at mealtime, we often call grace. Uh, there, there's, there's a prayer at bedtime, I hope. And I hope there's a prayer when you wake up in the morning. Prayer, prayer is a thing. On the other hand, praying is doing something, okay? So does prayer make a difference? I know that's a silly question to ask you folks, but I ask it anyhow this morning. Because you, as you well know, I just want to say it, prayer changes the world. Praying heals the sick. Praying makes terrible situations bearable. Prayer brings comfort. Prayer brings peace. Praying produces miracles. I hope you believe that. And I mean, are not these the reasons that you and I are found praying? Amen? Now, sadly, for some people, these are the only times the Lord hears them pray. So let me remind you of this. Prayer brings glory to God. That's the best thing we can be doing at all times, bringing God glory. Doing it accomplishes uh, the task of acknowledging His supremacy over all things, both the things that we see and all that multitude and bazillion things that go unseen by us. Praying affords us the opportunity to confess our sins. As it oftentimes 
in these times of prayers, in the presence of God himself, we see revealed what needs to be confessed and what needs to be repented of. Which reminds me, the very first legitimate act of praying, once we are accountable for our sinfulness, brings us into the kingdom of God. Do you remember that day for yourself? That's what we called the sinner's prayer, remember? Prayer brings us consciously into the presence of the Almighty to converse with Him, both on a very personal, personal, intimate level, but as well on a corporate level as the body of Christ, the church. Does praying make a difference? I, I want to show you an example from Scripture, the difference that praying makes. And in this example, there are two people involved. One is Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the other is the Apostle Peter. The setting for this is the Garden of Gethsemane. And all the disciples were there except the one named Judas who would show up later. You know the story, I'm sure. They, they had just finished what would become known as the Last Supper, something we're recognizing today. And now Jesus Christ needed to speak with God the Father. But folks, so did the other disciples, including Peter that night, but they were so very full of supper and, and very tired. So Jesus Christ, our Lord, prayed, and let me pick on him particularly, Peter did not. Did praying make a difference? Let's read Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. It is written, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he turned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So you see, thinking about this prayer and this praying, this was to be a time of corporate praying. But it didn't work out that way. Jesus desired the fellowship of praying in the unity of worship, even if it were, in a sense, I don't know if you're familiar with this term, if it were, in a sense, a watch night service. Have you ever been part of a watch night service where, where, where you come in and you, you just sit in a spirit of prayer and where there's no need for all, all present to speak, but to be meditating in the spirit of prayer? And, and folks, as these guys would have been doing that with Jesus, so do we when we do it. If, if these fellows would have done so, they would have discovered that they too were in much need of being able to discern God the Father's will in these hours and these next few days ahead of them. And we know what that brought. Things that we, will, things we need to get through 
in the night, time, night watches especially, into the next day, or maybe even three. So I want to ask you something this morning. When, when someone else is praying, and uh, what I'm talking about is when someone else is praying out loud, as we say, what are you doing while they are? I remember as a kid thinking, how long and boring is that preacher's pray? And I thought of a million different things while I waited for the amen to come. Well, praise be to God, for some reason, most of the time that has changed. So I'm asking you, what do you do? Well, the, here the disciples slept, like, like some people probably are right now. In fact, i got to tell you, at East Mahoning Baptist, oh, maybe I should have said it, East Mahoning Baptist, there was one lady in my congregation there who clipped her fingernails during the pastoral prayer. She, she, you know, she wasn't sleeping, and who knows? Women multitask, I understand that. But, but in this case, Jesus Christ even brought three of those fellows who were probably his closest friends with him to one of the most pivotal points in eternal history to pray, to be praying, and they slept. And he said to Peter, James, and John, James and John's the son of Zebedee, he said, my soul, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me, he asked. They fell asleep. And you know, Jesus knew what was laying ahead of him. His soul was going to be made an offering for the sin of the world. But my brothers and sisters, he was not sorrowful to the point of death because he was about to be arrested, because he was about to be mocked, slapped, punched, whipped, crowned with thorns, nailed to a cross, and stabbed with a spear in his side. Because he knew all that was going to happen before day one ever took place. He even had a guy named Isaiah quite plainly write about it all. No, he was sorrowful to the point of death because he knew just as well that the moment in time was at hand when the sin of the world would be upon him and his heavenly father, God, was going to turn his face away from him. Every single second and even before time had even been created, Jesus was in the center of God's will. But when he became sin for us, he suffered. He suffered. And yes, the physical stuff was painful beyond probably our imaginations, but this separation from God the Father was enough to kill him. In fact, it was hell itself. He knew this, so he mustered up the strength how? By praying. The strength to face it and the, fa the strength to endure it so that there on the cross of Calvary, he could not give Satan the pleasure of killing him, but that he could all on his own, all alone, as one hymn says, give up the ghost, die for you and me. Amen? Amen. Folks, the only way, thing I can imagine anywhere close to this, and I know it's not. Can you imagine if God the Holy Ghost was all of a sudden taken from you? I mean, that should make us shudder, weep, break out in a cold sweat to even think about it. And yet Jesus Christ, praying here in the Garden of Gethsemane, said, yes, yet not as I will, Father, but as you will. Wow. How often do we honestly pray that. So he comes back to his disciples. Couldn't you men keep watch with me one hour, he asked Peter. If that's what the scriptures say. This is why I'm picking on Peter today. And then Jesus basically said, if you're not willing to be praying with me, for me, you had better at least watch and pray for yourselves so that you don't fall into temptation. For after all, 
didn't I tell you when you asked me to pray, pray these words and lead us not into temptation. Fellas, you should be praying that right now and praying it like you mean it. Lead us not into temptation. But then again, Jesus knew their frailty. They were still spiritually immature disciples. I mean, the, the body wasn't where the spirit was, and I'll say yet. In fact, they were not where they should have been in this regard, and that was going to put them in the, into the danger of temptation and, and being easily led astray or away, which happened by the evil one, Satan. Folks, as you look around the church today, the decision by Christ's disciples to not mature spiritually is costing the church dearly. It's costing the families of our churches dearly. And it's costing the future of the church dearly. And I do mean dearly. Jesus knowing that praying makes a difference, went and prayed a second time, again concluding with, may your will be done, Father. And then he went to the disciples again, we're told. They were sleeping. He, he left them praying the third time, saying the same thing. It's called petition. Keep praying. Keep praying. Just say what you mean. Say what's on your heart. It doesn't matter if it's the same thing. We're not talking about those hypocritical prayers prayers of the, the Pharisees who were just saying it to be heard. Say what you mean. And, and if you don't know how to say it, just, just say, Lord, hear my heart. And then you try to figure out what it's saying, because it'll bless you when you do. But in this case, did praying make a difference? Oh, oh my. Yes, Jesus went to the cross. And he didn't call 10,000 angels to set him free, as the old hymn in scriptures goes. And God's will was done. Can you say hallelujah to that? Hallelujah. Amen. But let, let's look at something else here. Along with the way Jesus used praying, look at the way Peter handles the situation that night as a result of not praying. And I know this may not sound fair to Peter because, after all, Jesus knew what was coming, right? Well, Peter and Peter had the excuse of handling things poorly because he didn't know, right? Well, let's find out if that's true or not. Because here's a lesson that we can learn when it comes to our own situations and find that we have handled things poorly. Thanks be to God for the Holy Scriptures. We, like Jesus Christ, can know what is coming. Peter was made aware of what was ahead, and if he would have been praying, things would have been different for him. So listen to what Peter had, had heard. And this was just a few days before this Thursday night into Friday that we're talking about from Matthew. It's Luke chapter 21, verses 8 through 19. Because here we hear Jesus teaching, preaching. He replied, starting verse 8, Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. I'm reading all this for our benefit. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourself. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. 
you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives, and, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Remember what I said was costing us in the church and our families dearly a few minutes ago? This is the result of that. But not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. And all the people said, Amen. Jesus preached it. He teached it. I know that's not a word. He taught it. Peter heard it. And if he had been praying Thursday night instead of sleeping, he probably would have handled things much differently. Did you ever wish you would have handled things much differently? My friends, God's word has very, very much to do with our prayers and the difference it makes. And, and that when, I, when I heard those words, if the word of God is our daily bread, then prayer is our breath, I'd say hallelujah. Our oxygen, excuse me. If we desire that God's will be done, and I mean, who doesn't, right? We will only know that it has been and is being done, even if we don't understand it, if we are into his word and into praying. So I want you to just turn back to Matthew chapter 26 for a moment. We, we finished up at verse 46 where Jesus said, after praying three times, the same thing. He said, rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. And in verse 50 of that same chapter, Judas comes, betrays Jesus Christ with a kiss. In verse 51, Peter draws a sword and handles this situation that comes without praying with violence. And I want to share with you what Jesus shares in verse 52 and 56. He said to the guy who didn't pray, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Folks, scriptures are going to be fulfilled. And in that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching. And you did not arrest me. But this has taken place that the writings of the prophets, the word of God, might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Can you believe that, disciples of Jesus Christ? All this must take place that the writings of God's holy words might be fulfilled. And in this scenario, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Can you imagine? You wouldn't do that, would you? You know what? I'd like to say to Peter, yes, Peter. But then I have to say to Mark, yes, Mark. As Jesus said, every day teaching from God's holy word in his Father's house of prayer, as he called it, where praying is the thing to be doing. Were you listening, Peter? Were you listening, Mark? Are you listening? Look at Peter in verse 58. He follows from afar, hiding in the shadows. But Peter followed him in a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. Oh, don't you just, aren't you just waiting for the outcome of all this crap that's going on in the world? And maybe your own situations. And then we see Jesus responding because he prays in, in verse 63. It says he held his peace. He remained silent. But. That is, until it was God's will for him to say. Remember what we read earlier about standing before authorities and having the words? Look at verse 64, where Jesus replied, But I say to all of you, and boy, am I glad. I'm so glad he put this in, like right here. 
He said, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Oh, man, I can't wait. Everybody's going to see that. Some aren't going to be as excited as others when it happens. And we're not going to go there because we don't have time this morning. But all the while this was going on and being said with Jesus the praying one, Peter, in verses 69 through 74, is denying Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, the Messiah, three times and adding cursing and swearing for effect. Have you ever been there and done that? I know when push comes to shove, even as a pastor, I've been around people who got to that point. Boy, if you want to make something effective, throw in some cuss words. Amen? Yeah. We should be more mature than that, actually. But Jesus, Jesus having prayed, is living out the words that we read in Luke chapter 21. Well, he who slept finally came, finally came to a moment of clarity according to verse 75 of chapter 26 when he remembered. Because it says he remembered the words Jesus had spoken, the word of God. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And what did Peter do? He went outside and wept bitterly. It's that moment of clarity. Now, before we come to the table, I just want to remind you what I said earlier. Prayer changes the world. Prayer heal, praying heals the sick. Praying makes terrible situations bearable. Praying brings comfort. Praying brings peace. Praying produces miracles. Praying brings glory to God. Doing it accomplishes his supremacy over all things, both seen and unseen. Praying affords us the opportunity to confess our sins, as in, in oftentimes in the light of God's presence while we're praying, those sins will be revealed that we might confess them and repent of them. So with that, can you imagine what went through the Apostle Peter's mind the first time that he observed the Lord's Supper? Doing it in remembrance of Jesus. Reflecting back once more on the events that took place and the praying that did and the praying that did not. You know what, folks? This is not a bad way to come to this table. And do you know what I mean? Forgiven. Let's come forgiven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we join together in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we do so, Lord, humbled. Humbled in our forgetfulness. Hum humbled in our lack of praying. Father God, in the light of the scriptures of today and using our Savior and one of the great fathers of the faith, Peter, as an example, Father God, we come before you confessing our sins and repenting of them as we turn from them, thanking you for the cross of Calvary and the precious blood shed there for the remissions of sins and for the life we share, knowing that as we share at this table this morning, dear Lord, that we'll be doing it soon with our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in heaven itself. And for this, we are truly thankful. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing number 433, I Surrender All.
be seated. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before this table, we do so, Lord, having confessed our sins. Lord, thank you for the cleansing. Thank you for the joy of being present here this morning and, and joining together in this communion where we remember the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your one and only begotten Son, who willingly, according to your will, was beaten, slapped, crown of thorn placed upon his head, carried a heavy cross towards the hill of Golgotha, almost didn't make it, dear Lord, but your will was done. It was accomplished. So as we think of this broken body today, as we take in this bread, Father God, may our hearts be truly grateful as we do it in the humility of those who understand. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Deacons.
The scriptures tell us the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he be was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father God, as we bow our heads before this table, we do know we do so bowing our heads before your throne. And Father God, as we do this with, with the cup before us filled with the crimson juice of the vine, dear Lord, we're reminded that Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And that life that flowed through Jesus' veins as he walked this earth, dear Lord, and, and that life which flowed from him on the cross of Calvary was shed for, for, for you. It was shed for me, we said. And so, Lord, again, humbled in your presence, humbled with the truth, we thank you for this in Jesus' holy and his precious name. Amen. There is new wine, there is new power, there is new freedom, and the kingdom is here. I lay down my old flames to carry a new fire today. Because when there is new wine, there is new power.
The scriptures go on and say, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Join together and sing, bless the tie that binds, and we're going to close this morning with the Lord's Prayer. You thought I forgot. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Have a safe, safe and happy weekend. God bless you all.